Hey, thanks for so much for joining us at GM Insights today. It's just 12 noon, and so we're going to start in just a second. Just wanted to check in, Dr. Hales, are you all set for your slides and sharing? Yep. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you fine. Do you want to go ahead and just go ahead and start screen share? Yes. Chad Hales, MD, PhD, is the clinical director of the Cognitive Neurology Program here at Emory University. He's also an associate professor in the Department of Neurology. And uh, this, was a this was a special request, um, uh, definitely by me and probably by several other folks. And so I'm really excited. If you didn't recognize Chad, his picture was fully bearded in the advertisement, but that is him. I can attest that I've seen him with beard and without beard. So Chad, let's turn it over to you. And I'm really excited to hear about the cases and kind of uh, certainly what I learned in residency training program isn't as relevant today in terms of what neuroimaging can do for us in terms of helping us with differential diagnosis. So over to you. Thanks, Chad. All right. Make sure I got my screen sorted out here. So having me on the on the session today, I'll try to give a, a brief overview of some neuroradiology uh, interesting cases and approach and um, and hopefully leave a little bit of time for some questions at the end. So here's the uh, obligatory disclosure slide. Um, nothing that has too much relevance for the talk today other than um, I've kind of functioned in a PI in a sub I role on several uh, Emory um, industry sponsored uh, uh, trials. So, so I thought I would take a, a tiny step back and talk a little bit about kind of routine for reviewing brain imaging, um, review some of the, the the brain imaging findings that we that we may see and how they may help inform our diagnosis. And then also I want to hit on some of the common pitfalls of brain imaging interpretation. Um, and this includes both reviewing scans and also reviewing reports, um, which is where I think one of the more challenging things uh, that, that we see um, show up and in confusion for both uh, providers and patients alike. So and feel free to, um, if you have questions as we're going through, um, certainly drop those into the chat. I won't be monitoring that, but we'll get to those questions at the end. And I think Ted's also, if you see something that looks really relevant and you want to interrupt me, let me know for sure, um, Ted, and I'll be happy to answer it as we go along. So, so I think it's important to first put the, the brain imaging in context with the remainder or the rest of the, the whole diagnostic process for our patients that have cognitive impairment. So this is just one piece of the puzzle, right? You've got your brain imaging, you've got your clinical history, you've got your exam, you've got scales that tell you about cognition and that tell you about mood. Um, and now you've also got biomarkers, right? You've got spinal fluid and sp special brain imaging studies. And in some cases, you've even got genetics to help you as, as, as it, you guide that diagnostic process for the individual patients. And so I want to be mindful about trying to pull this out and say you can use brain imaging as you know, the main way to diagnose somebody because you need to look at it as, well, it's supportive, right? If you see something on the brain imaging that that fits within the clinical context for that patient um, and, and helps you with that diagnosis, great. But if you don't see a whole lot on the brain imaging, if there's anything you remember from today, if you don't see a whole lot on the brain imaging that supports that underlying clinical context, that doesn't mean it's not there because there can be a mismatch between the amount of atrophy or shrinkage or changes on the brain and the clinical presentation for the patient. So one thing that's really important to avoid is avoid getting a brain image and the report comes back normal. And then you as the provider talk with the patient and say, well, you know, I know you're having these symptoms, but your brain scan is normal, says so here in the report. And therefore you're, you know, there's nothing going on with you. And so that's, if you remember anything from this, that, that's an important point um, for patient care. So, so it functions to help us out with etiological diagnosis, right? So the, the, we really want to understand what's causing those brain cells um, not to work, right? Why, why are they not working? And so that's where you're trying to decide, well, is there Alzheimer's? Is there vascular? Is there frontal temporal dementia? And of course, with the MRI, it doesn't give you down to the microscopic level, but if you see patterns on there, sometimes it's helpful with that etiological diagnosis. So a couple of systematic points that are important when you're reviewing scans. 
One is if possible, review the scans yourself, even if you're not a scan expert. And that's kind of what I hope by the end of our brief time today, it'll it at least make you say, well, maybe I could go in and take a look at that scan because it, it's in some cases, it's not as hard as it looks. Um, there are nuances. I recognize that. And that takes year, you know, months and years of practice to pick that up. But there are some things that you can kind of pick up on. And I'm, I'll show you a couple of those today that are pretty obvious. The other thing is, you know, you've got the patient in front of you. And so you know what the clinical symptoms are. And so you want to look for changes on the scan that help support that diagnosis by looking at those areas of the brain that may be causing that problem. And so what do I mean by that? Well, let's say they have memory problems, difficulty repeating themselves or, or you know, perhaps re recalling the conversation that happened the other day. And so you're going to want to look at the hippocampus. Or let's say they're having more trouble with processing challenges. Maybe they're calcu trouble calculating tips. Maybe they're having more trouble with their phone. Well, maybe look in the frontal lobe and see if they have some vascular changes or something going on there that would su suggest some executive dysfunction. So use that clinical knowledge as you interpret that scan. And that's one place where we as the providers have a bit of a leg up on the radiologist, right? Because the radiologist, all they get is maybe one term, patient has memory loss or patient has a family history of memory loss or patient has a broken leg, look at their brain. You know, they're not, may, may not be getting a whole lot um, with respect to that image. So, um, so that's important as well. And I've already mentioned this, but recognize the, the amount and location of atrophy may not correlate at times. So let's start briefly by, by looking at a couple of different kind of normal based uh, images here. And this slide is important because it, it's going to help you as you start to develop a process. And of course, with the MRI, and I'm not going to look too much at, at head CTs today because in head CTs are actually pretty good these days. And, uh, and sometimes we'll have a head CT and we actually get axial, we get coronal, we get sagittal views, and they provide nice views of, 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 of atrophy, but the resolution is not as good on head CTs. And, and in some cases, you don't, you can't see some of the more subtle findings, especially in vascular. But on the MRI, you're going to want to take an organized approach. And this is the one I take. You start with the flare image. And so here I'm showing you a couple of those. And the flare image is, if you'll recall back to your medical school days, is basically a T2 where the spinal fluid uh, white signal has been removed. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to look in these subcortical white matter tracts and see whether or not there's any vascular or, or T2 hyperintensities. A caution with the flare, you can use it to start to gauge some understanding of atrophy, but be careful. The amount of atrophy on the flare can sometimes look a little exaggerated as compared to T1. So once you've looked at the flare to see if there are any vascular changes, then you're going to go to your T1s. And if you have it, it's really helpful to look at the axial, coronal, and sagittal views because that allows you to look at different parts of the brain in a different way. So you've already looked at a flare axial. So I often will skip a T1, but on the T1, a T1 axial, but on the T1 coronal, this allows you to look down into the middle part of the brain and, and take a peek at the hippocampus. Um, and I'll show you on the next slide what that might look like if it was abnormal. But you're looking at the hippocampus, which is this little squiggly structure here. You're looking at the entorhinal cortex, which is here and can show some thinning. And so that's the main reason for looking at the coronal image is to really get a good feel for those neural fissure. Then I look at the T1 sagittal. And so this allows you to compare frontal lobe to parietal lobe to occipital lobe. And it really helps if you're trying to decide, well, is there some parietal lobe atrophy like what we might see in an Alzheimer's patient? This patient not really showing a whole lot of difference as you move back and forth. And the other caveat to this slide is I'm just showing you one slice. And so the important piece about reviewing scans is you really need to have all the slices there for the individual sequences to, to really understand and get a good picture of the brain. But here you're looking for parietal, you're looking for frontal. Most of the time, the occipital lobe is well preserved, even in Alzheimer's disease until late in the course of the illness. So you can many times use the occipital lobe as a, well, what should normal brain look like, even though you may, may have a diseased brain in front of you. Then you want to look at a couple other special sequences, and this is especially important as we are really in this new era of disease-modifying therapies. 
you want to look at the sequence that allows you to see whether there are have been previous history of microhemorrhages on the brain. And there are three different types that you'll see show up depending on the type of scanner that was used. The most updated version is susceptibility weighted imaging. And then older versions are gradient echo and T2 star. And I'll show you some examples of uh, hemorrhage later, uh, but th these are important to start to look at these. And this is one of those scans, especially the SWI, where, um, where you can start to take a look and, and see some findings. And then finally, DWI or diffusion weighted imaging. We often don't spend a whole lot of time on this in the outpatient setting, but for patients who've had a, acute strokes, ischemic strokes, you'd see little bright white spots show up on this one. And so I do look at this scan just to see if there's incidental strokes and in special cases where there may be a patient who has a more rapidly progressive dementia, um, you may actually see some findings that could suggest prion disease. And in that case, you might see some brightness down here in the middle part of the brain or some cortical ribboning. So now you're an expert, right? You've got the different sequences, flare, T1s, looking for hemorrhages on the SWI or DWI. And we're gonna, we know now that it's important to look at different views of the brain to help us understand, well, do we see some mesial temporal lobe structure changes or do we see some changes uh, across the frontal parietal or occipital axis? I put this slide in here just to provide a little bit of a background on how a mesial temporal lobe atrophy is graded. And so you'll some, sometimes see these numbers show up in reports, but the bottom line is this, it's just really to highlight that it's not terribly hard to pick this up. If you've got a coronal image and you look down here at the mesial part of the temporal lobe, the hippocampus, especially as you start to get atrophy, it kind of falls away from the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. So in a normal patient, this is just a, a space that's kind of compressed, right? But there's spinal fluid there. But as you develop atrophy, you start to open up this space. And the atrophy is not only in the hippocampus, but it's usually in the surrounding tissues as well. And so when you start to see that, that's suggestive of some mesial temporal lobe atrophy. And in the right clinical uh, scenario, if the patient has memory loss and appropriate age, et cetera, could suggest Alzheimer's disease. What else do we see? Well, of course, we see vascular changes. It can be really obvious, like what you see on this scan here, or it can be maybe a little more subtle, like what you see here. One of the questions often comes up, well, how do you grade it? And how do you decide, is it causing symptoms? And there are several different grading scales. I don't want you to remember these, but just to know that one we use on the research side kind of lumps people into one through eight scale. There's something called the Fazekas grade, um, which is maybe a little a little bit less um, of a, uh, a resolution for those changes. And here you're looking at very mild maybe some more mild to moderate and here more severe changes. And then you have things like this, which are mild, moderate, or severe. And, you know, it's kind of a judgment call in some cases. And in, in many cases, you're often trying to decide as the provider, well, how much are these uh, changes contributing to the patient's symptoms? And in some cases, it's not clear because you will see a mismatch. You might see a patient that has lots of vascular changes, um, but still doing pretty well cognitively. And, you know, in that particular case, look, looking for other causes can be important, or maybe they just have a lot of cognitive reserve. In cases where you all, where you see a mixed picture, um, then it becomes more difficult to say, well, which of the processes is actually contributing to the patient's symptoms? Chad, in the examples that you've presented so far, in every case, zero is normal, and as you go up in number, it's more abnormal, or does it just depend on the scale? Yeah, so for the white matter grading scale, you hardly ever see these used even in the reports. Um, and so you often will see mild, moderate, or severe. Um, and, and that's what I use. And, and when I'm talking, when I write my notes, and that's also what you see for the neuroradiologist as well. But yeah, so here it's an ordinal scale, the higher is, is worse. So here's a, here's a test sample for you. I will let you guys just take a kind of a, a quick look at the scan. And um, if you feel like dropping in the chat um, and I'll kind of keep an eye on it, um, let me know what you think. Now, where do you feel like you see some changes? And uh, once we get there, um, we'll um, you know, drop something in the chat if you feel like you see some changes you want me to comment on. So I see somebody saying frontal disease. So um, 
So it's so pretty astute there, right? You're looking here um, on the flare image. You can see a little bit there. Um, the T1 makes it a little more obvious, right? On this left side of the brain. Um, the right side looks relatively well preserved. Sometimes you can use, this is a great example of how you can use the ventricular system, the lateral ventricles here, if you see an asymmetry. And so that's enlargement of the ventricular system because of some of the atrophy superficially. And so sometimes that can be an initial clue that there's something going on you need to look for. And you can even appreciate that here on the coronal image, right? On this left side of the scan, this just feels a little more sparse as you're looking uh, cortically at the sulci. I see a left hippocampal atrophy, nice. So if you look down here in the temporal lobe, you can see that there's more space um, around that um, uh, lateral ventricle there in the inferior horn. So suggesting but either hippocampal or hippocampal and temporal, which in this case, you've got both, right? You've got the hippocampus looking really tiny um, and you've got, um, again, some, some atrophy in that temporal lobe. And this is a good example of where the sagittal can be helpful. So I'm showing you the um, so showing you the left and the right side on the sagittal. And if you can put those side by side, um, you can actually look in and see the hippocampus. I don't have both cuts of that for you here, um, but sometimes you can see the hippocampus in there, make some judgment, but you can also see the temporal pole. I didn't really comment on that on the previous scan, but um, the sagittal gives you a nice view of the temporal pole. So yeah, great. You, you guys you guys nailed it. You got some frontal atrophy, you got some temporal and mesial temporal lobe atrophy, and um, we kind of walked through all of those different things. So this is a patient who who likely has a frontal temporal dementia as part of their process. But you know the important thing about these um, different disorders is that again the MRI only it, it just gives you supportive information. You'd really need biomarker testing moving forward to see whether it was AD or um, or um, uh, FTD. So here's our next one. Um, so take just a quick look there and make some comments if you like. Yeah, ventricular megaly was mentioned. So, you know, when you look at this one here on the T1, aren't terribly enlarged. Um, but that is a good point, and that's something that often comes up: is you know well, how big or too how big how big are ventricles, and how, are they too big? And is it because of the atrophy or shrinkage in the brain, or is it due to some other process? And in this case, probably atrophy, right? So you can see up here, there's a fair bit of cortical atrophy, even parietal. White matter disease, yep, hyperintensity. Uh, so um, you can actually see a little bit on the flare, but you can also see that duskiness, right? So on the T1. Um, you're actually getting some of this, uh, some of this kind of darkness, which is the same as the brightness that you might see over on the flare. And this is, you know, certainly moderate to severe um, in, in range. Of course, on the gradient echo here, getting a little bit of changes down in the middle part of the brain um, that could be microhemorrhages, one right here, perhaps. So we'll go ahead and just point out a couple of things there, the vascular changes. This patient had a few lacoons there as well, um, showing the parietal atrophy, maybe a little bit of hippocampal atrophy here too. And yeah, you guys got it, right? And in large ventricles there posteriorly. So um, this patient likely has a mixed process um, given that there's some, some vascular changes as well as some atrophy. And so you might say, well, could this represent uh, an AD vascular type of a picture? So what are some of the challenges, and I'll get back to some more images in a moment, what are some of the challenges of brain imaging interpretation? And probably one of the first ones that I've already mentioned is just be cautious with normal scans and telling the, the patient that there's nothing wrong, because sometimes the scan may be normal, but yet there are still some subtle changes you can't see yet, or sometimes the report may not be entirely accurate, and I'll show you that in a moment. This is something commonly that you see that I alluded to just a moment ago. You might see a report that says the patient has normal pressure hydrocephalus. We see that all the time in head CTs and MRIs. And, you know, oftentimes it's, it's due to enlargement of ventricles and cortical atrophy more so than a process of NPH. And so just being cautious about that. I've even seen patients who were diagnosed with NPH and they dropped a shunt in without even doing any of the pre and the post stuff coming from the outside. And when you look at it, it's just profound atrophy throughout. And so likely not MPH at all, but likely neurodegenerative. 
be cautious about reports that, that go ahead and make a diagnosis. This can be very frustrating for patients when they see their report and the radiologist tells them they have Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia and um, otherwise are totally normal with their cognition. And so that also has to be taken into account. Again, putting the, the scan in context with the patient. And I'll talk about this one a bit in a minute. Um, you'll see this show up often that there is no evidence of hemorrhage. And the reason that becomes important, again, is because of the disease modifying therapies for Alzheimer's. And this is to highlight one of those examples. So here I'm showing you a flare image, a um, little bit of some mild vascular changes throughout. You can maybe see here based on those uh, mesial temporal atrophy scores I showed you earlier, getting some enlargement of that ventricular horn of the lateral ventricle. A little bit of hippocampal atrophy, right? Some entorhinal atrophy, some, so some sagging of that hippocampus moving down. This is a patient who had a relatively classic um, profile or symptoms that were consistent with Alzheimer's disease and some short-term memory issues and repetitive in conversation. Of course, when going through all the different senses, I'm not going to show you all of them now, but I'll show you some relevant ones. Um, you look at the, the susceptibility weighted image and all of a sudden you start to see a couple of micro hemorrhages. If you move further up, you got another one there, another one there, another one there, even further up, more of these things. And you're like, oh, got some micro hemorrhages in an older patient that has Alzheimer's disease. Some of these cortical distribution could tell us about another pathological process called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is where amyloid gets deposited in the blood vessel walls. And so this is something that you can see coexisting with Alzheimer's disease. It's also something that as we're, we're thinking about lecanemab and disease modifying therapies that are exclusionary criteria if you have enough of them. And the reason I bring this up is because this patient's report, I won't show you names of who read it, but as you know, in the report there, there's a lot of information. And I would venture to guess that most providers, they're going to go straight to that impression. And they're going to be like, ah, medial temporal lobe atrophy, entorhinal cortex atrophy, memory syndrome, looks like Alzheimer's disease and leave it at that. Some providers might look up at the findings just to see if anything else was mentioned. And in this particular case, they kind of talk a little bit about some T2 hyperintensities, which, as you notice, were not discussed in the impression. You'll also notice that this radiologist read no hemorrhage. Well, if I take you back to these scans, you can see that there are hemorrhages scattered throughout the brain. And so this is the one of a couple of words of caution on these reports. And the importance of, if possible, reviewing some of your scans. And as that is, Number one, all the findings that a radiologist may see, they may not mention them in the impression. And number two, sometimes there are abnormal findings on the scan the radiologist may not mention at all. And so that's important as we're thinking about um, uh, eligibility for different medications. Here, I'm just showing you another patient that actually has more microhemorrhages. This again, more classic Alzheimer's patient, um, high, you know, cortical-based microhemorrhages. Um, this is a gradient echo, and so I'm showing you a couple of different scans here. And um, just to, again, highlight the microhemorrhages can occur, and you do have to look for them. Just a couple of slides here on some interesting imaging findings. Um, of course, with Alzheimer's disease therapies, um, there is a risk of some swelling or microhemorrhages. And here I'm showing you an example of a pre- and post-treatment scan where this patient had some, um, had some aria form. Um, so as we move forward in time, um, recognizing that, you know, there are going to be some new things that may start showing up in your reports with respect to our patient population. In this particular case, the patient had both ARIA-E, which is edema for swelling, as well as ARIA-H. This is, again, that special scan that allows you to see the blood products. And you can see these little tiny spots here, as well as scattered throughout the brain, likely from the medication. Other types of imaging studies, and this is a whole discussion in itself, but you know, radio pharmaceuticals, um, radio label ligands that help us to, to label amyloid and other proteins in the brain, um, also available. And here I'm showing you an example of a, a patient that has Alzheimer's disease versus one that um, is, is normal. And so learning to read these scans gets a little bit more nuanced and challenging. Um, but, you know, here's one example where they use a heat map and then here's another one where you can actually see negative scan versus positive scan that look a little bit harder to tell the difference. 
And the main difference is that in the negative scan, most of the radio tracer uptake is subcortical, whether the, whereas the rest in a positive scan, you get more cortical labeling. And the reason I wanted to share this scan with you is uh, mainly because of the, the report issue and also the expertise issue of reading these scans as we move forward. And so this is an example of a patient um, that I've been in contact with and seeing soon where they had a amyloid PET scan. This is not that one um, that was read as highly suggestive of uh, amyloid deposition in the brain. However, upon uh, my review, felt like the scan wasn't great, um, but was probably negative, had our team review it, and it was read as entirely negative and normal. And so this is another word of caution with brain imaging in these radiopharmaceuticals is it does take a level of expertise to review these. And as we move forward in time, just making sure that you have lots of great members on your team um, to help care for these patients when you're, that have underlying cognitive impairment. One final word are some incidental omas. So um, you know, some other things that pop up well, are the findings on the scan that may have nothing to do with the patient's cognitive symptoms. And this is an example of a patient that has some kind of goomba sitting in the middle of their third ventricle. And here's another, so this first, this is on the flare. This is on the uh, T1. This is the T1 post. So it's got some enhancement. Here's the coronal showing you sitting there. Here's the sagittal sitting right there in the middle of the third. And then here's that uh, scan showing blood products. So it's actually got a little bit of bleeding around it as well. So this is uh, was interpreted as a large cavernoma um, sitting in the patient's third ventricle. Had nothing to do with the patient's symptoms, but was there. So again, just being cautious that incidental findings will pop up. Meningiomas are probably the most common and it's important um, to be careful about interpreting how those may be impacting the patient's cognitive symptoms. So take home messages. Make sure you review your scans if you can. Try to, try to start taking a look at these and make sure you agree with the radiologist. Always remember that that normal or negative scan may not be normal or negative. Um, and just be careful about concluding that a normal scan means nothing is wrong with the brain. Putting imaging contacts and you know imaging findings in context with the patient is critical because you as the provider have the ability to, to, to recognize and match findings on the MRI with what the patient has based on what you know about the brain and where those symptoms may localize. Sometimes patients may have more than one abnormal finding, such as vascular or patterns of atrophy. So just keeping that in mind. And then finally being cautious about how, how you interpret um, those incidental um, findings. So let me stop there. Uh, see what questions you have. That's kind of a whirlwind tour of uh, radiology. And uh, thanks for having me. Hey, Chad, that was superb. Really appreciate it. There are two questions. One is a little bit up in the up in the stream. It's from Dr. Kolreshtha. And he might uh, just come off of mute and ask that. And then Dr. Masi had a question afterwards. Hey, Chad. Uh, excellent talk. Um, so my question is that, you know, you don't have scans of people when they are normal. So I think that creates this issue that uh, what you're seeing is a new change or it's this, the brain has always been like that. So that's where, you know, I struggle with. And the other thing is that are these, the volumes and everything that we measure on MRI, they are adjusted for height and brain volumes. So, you know, I would appreciate your comments on that. Yeah, yeah. So the, the normal question, you're right, you know, patients who are cognitively normal, we don't often get a chance to review those as often. And so you're not building that database of what a normal scans look like. The volumetric piece, you know, there are software packages that will allow you to do volumetrics and Emory even had one for a while, but decide, you know, decided not to pay for it anymore. Um, and, you know, we we found that we were using it occasionally to kind of support what our underlying interpretation was versus using it as the primary means to say whether or not there was atrophy. Um, whether or not that gets mainstreamed as we move forward, maybe, you know, you could imagine it being a little bit more helpful. One of the challenges is that sometimes with the volumetric software is that if you use the automated detection of structures, it may not assign the structures properly. And so you just have to be cautious about those interpretations and, and, and going back in and really getting a good feel for what that brain looks like. As far as adjusting for size, again, I mean, they have volumetric tables for those software packages, but um, it's just tough in the clinical um, practice to, to use those. A couple other questions Chad, here. Dr. Hey, yeah, Chad, Dr. Chris Mossy had a question as well. Chris, yes, do you want to just ask that? So Thank you for your talk. I feel like I'm a budding neuroradiologist now. So I 
I learned a lot. Um, so I was impressed with the uh, slide you showed uh, for the amyloid pet showing positive uh, images for Alzheimer's disease. And it made me wonder, you know, what the indication for the amyloid pet is. If we suspect Alzheimer's, should those folks all get the amyloid PET scan? So biomarker testing, such as amyloid te uh, PET, as well as um, spinal fluid testing, needs to be part of the conversation if you think that information is going to change management downstream for the patient. You know, if you've got someone who's already quite impaired, um, having that clarity is probably not going to change their management. If you have someone who's very mildly impaired, then and doesn't have other possible exclusion criteria for downstream treatment, then it becomes uh, uh, perhaps a little more important. I myself am actually struggling a little bit with the amyloid PET scans interpretations. Um, they're used frequently on the research side, but it only gives you a picture of amyloid. And so that's where actually spinal fluid testing gives you measures of amyloid and tau, which is helpful because then you know that tau is changing as well. And we know that tau correlates a little bit better with the onset of clinical symptoms. So I think as we move forward, um, you know, amyloid PET may be paired with say plasma tau assays or other things that help us with diagnostics. The feasibility of getting everybody an amyloid PET is not great. Um, right? Because just of access and cost and all these types of things. So I, I just, I don't know that it's, it's going to be the mainstream tool that we'll use long-term for these diagnostics, but it is something that's acceptable for showing that someone has amyloid in their brain. All right. Thanks. Hey, Chad, uh, if you have time for one more question, it's Dr. Anna Merck over as the geriatric fellowship director. And if I could tag on a piece to her question, it's like, how do you how do you know what to order? How do you gain, gain to trust the neuroradiologist? And then Anna, could you just come on and ask your question? Because I think it flows from that too. She may be having trouble coming uh -huh. off of mute. Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. there it goes. Okay, I wasn't sure the video. Uh, yeah, thank you for this um, talk. It was great. Um, I, you know, I'm, my practice is primarily at the VA, and I, I rarely see any mention of, even if the MRIs are ordered specifically for like dementia evaluation or cognitive evaluation of like hippocampal volume or anything, is there, does this differ by like who's reading it, like neuroradiologists versus general, or is there something we should be specifically asking for when we put in a request? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, on the Emory side, we do have a couple of uh, dementia specific protocols where they know we're, we're looking what we're looking for and why we're looking for it. And they will typically comment on at least the MTA score. Um, but you're absolutely right. It depends on the expertise of the radiologist who's taking a look at it. If it's a neuroradiologist, sometimes they'll comment on it and sometimes they won't. And in some cases, you may have hippocampal atrophy and you don't even see a mention of it. And some of it is how you're writing the um, request for the scan and you know, making sure to give as much clinical information as possible. Um, that can be helpful. Um, and for Ted's question, you know, what type of scan do you order? We, we have a protocol, but, you know, we don't always get that, right? We get patients coming in from the community who had an MRI a couple months ago and we're, we don't have those high resolution images, but we make it work. Um, and so, again, we try to balance having a scan versus you know, utilization of resources and getting the perfect scan um, for patients. It becomes a little more important when we're thinking about patients we have on disease modifying therapy like lecanemab. To start, we really want patients to have one of the higher resolution scans so we can really know how many microhemorrhages they have um, as, as we're thinking about inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, but there's not an easy answer to a question. Radiologists are all over the place um, with respect to reads. And it can be a little frustrating. I, I have I have reached out multiple times to different radiologists and asked, why didn't you mention this finding <laughs> um, in your report? And um, it again, they don't have the patient in front of you, so they don't have that. I, I think that they're really missing that piece. And part of that, I think, is just in the radiologist culture. And I don't know how we fix that. Um, but having a good trusted set of neuroradiologists, like I know one or two folks that I trust maybe a couple more on the Emory system. When I see their name on it, I know they did a really good job with that scan. I'm still going to look at the scan myself, um, but you know, I know that they gave it a good go. Um, but there are some others I'm like, I mean, I don't even know if I, I just can't, can't believe it, right? You just got to go in and look. And, and I'm, I apologize for 
for talking and creating doubt for you guys on some of your scans. But but this is this is a real this is a real problem uh, I see that, that we have. And again, it's more the most the biggest issue I see now is that they're not calling micro hemorrhages like they should be. And so if you've got a patient where you're thinking about disease modifying therapy to answer the question about the amyloid pet, if they've already got you know 30 micro hemorrhages on their MRI. They don't need an amyloid pet at this point. They've probably got CAA uh, and cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and they're not going to be eligible for tr for treatment anyway. So, yeah. And can I add, Chad and Anna? Sometimes what they do, Anna, is I under comments when I request in a radiology an MRI, I say please include coronal cuts because this is a study for dementia. Sometimes it works. And sometimes I send them back, and they actually look at the scans and they report it and they, they correct the report. So that's something that you could do too. Just yeah. adding in the comment, please do coronal cuts. I found that at least at Grady, it really works. So. And the last comment on AI, great comment. You know, will we have, and they sort of tried to get at that with the software that looks at volumetrics. Um, and it, it, it will eventually get there. I, and I've already asked about this. Can you create an AI software that actually finds susceptibility weighted um, changes like micro hemorrhages and other things? And the answer is probably yes. Um, at what point will it get be good enough so that we as providers feel comfortable with those results? And that's, we'll just have to see as we move through time. Hey, I want to thank everybody for attending. Please, please, please take an opportunity to evaluate this presentation. Uh, Chad, by just sheer number of attendees, you either tied Jim Law or <laughs> exceeded Jim Law. It's kind of that home run end of the season sort of thing. We don't know who's going to be the eventual champion, but thanks for a great session. It was highly enjoyable, very educational. And uh, really appreciate the great audience that you brought in. So thanks so much. Hey, everybody, I also put into the chat a link we moved all of our GM Insight YouTubes, YouTube recordings of all of these sessions into one place. So you can actually go and look and find uh, different things that you might be looking for. Hey, thanks so much. Appreciate you joining us today. Bye.